Good morning. Welcome to Bible Mornings. It is Friday. That means it's time for our deep dive into the Gospel of Luke. I'm with my good friend, Nate Wall. Nate, welcome aboard. Uh, Hello. Coming to us from Hamilton, Ontario, as per usual. I'm in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and I've already had to shovel this morning, Nate, so we're off to a bad start. Oh, well, you guys do. It is coming down here like it might never stop. So that's why I've got my got my oh, yeah. Canadian Mountie mug out, Perfect. wearing my toque. You yep. call this a toque up here, Greg? I, I know, and I, I got to say, like, of all the Canadian things, that may be my favorite. I think, like, of the, of the ones I've tried to incorporate into my life, I've, yeah. I, I also call them toques now. Because beanies or snow hats, or they all sound stupid, but toque, that sounds like, ah, like that's... That's got some some stuff to it. I like it. I like Tuke better. So, um, all right. But if you're joining us for the first time, we go through the Gospel of Luke. We go through it a little bit at a time, and we ask questions about it. We ask questions to each other, and we just kind of see where the passages take us. Uh, so hopefully you are in for a fun ride this morning. I believe, Nate, that we are finally ready to start Chapter 2. I believe you are right. Yes. All right. Good. I was nervous. You're like, no, that's not at all right, Greg. You're, you're way off. But uh, all right. So we are about to start chapter two. Uh, so we'll begin the way we, we usually do, which uh, Nate, I'll pray. And then if you want to read the first few chapters or the first few chapters, first few verses of chapter two, mm-hmm. and we'll just kind of see where, see where we go from there. All that's right. Uh, so if you would, let's join in prayer together. Gracious God this morning. We gather listening for your voice and searching out your word. We ask that you would speak and move as you have always spoke and moved, Lord, that you continue to speak to your people. You continue to draw us and lead us and guide us. And this morning, we are thankful for that guiding. And we pray that as we look at all the different ways you move and work in the lives of Jesus and his family in the politics of the first century and everything else surrounding it, that we, you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear what you're calling us to and the ways in which you're working and moving now around us. We thank you for your grace and your mercy towards us. And we pray this morning, especially that, uh, that you'd give us wisdom and discernment. And in your name, amen. Amen. All right. So Luke chapter two, and I'm going to read, uh, you, you've been reading from the NRSV, right? I have. Been. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'll continue with that. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. So all went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. All right. That Christmas going. Was that? So I I said it's Christmas today. We got snow and everything. Christmas, we got the snow. We have been very anti-snow on this on this uh this series and that is not changing this morning i'm still anti-snow but uh i will say that for a passage that we hear all the time like this is maybe one of the most read passages in the bible really when you think about how often you've probably heard it like you hear it every year you hear it two or three times every year usually around christmas every time you watch charlie brown whatever like it it shows up it shows up a bunch. Uh, so it's not one that anybody is really unfamiliar with, but I will say having had you read that, I did notice something that for the first time I've ever noticed in my whole life. Yeah. What was that? And, uh, and I, you know, file this under Greg just hasn't been paying attention. Um, Joseph and Mary in this account aren't married yet. Hmm. Um, 
And I, I don't know that I've ever thought about this before or that it matters at all, but it, it is one of those, like they're engaged to be married for sure. Um, and I, I, for some reason in my head, by the time they have Jesus, they're already married. But in Luke's account, that doesn't, I don't know if that's, if that's true or not, but it doesn't seem to be the case yet. No, it's not the case yet. And you're right. I don't think we do talk about it. There's, so there's something that's both, um, like there, there's something odd about uh, a couple like this who's betrothed but not married taking any journey at all together. Yeah. And there's something even weirder uh, in this in this particular time and place and in this Jewish community for Mary to be having a baby while they're not technically married. Now, engagement engagement means is sort of uh, is l- is even like notched up. Like one yeah. or two notches from what engagement is for us. It's yep. it's a it's a done deal. Um, yeah. You have to divorce someone to get unengaged. Yeah. Um, and we see a little bit of that in Matthew, Matthew chapter one, Matthew's um, story about Jesus' birth. Um, Joseph is thinking about that. Um, but here you're right. Yeah. Well, so what do you what is that well that sticks out to you for what reason, Greg? Well, I'm I assuming know, it, it, part of what I've said, but but yeah, probably, that's kind of it. Like it, I think in my head, I've just always assumed after Joseph has this meeting with the angel, they just get married right away. But it like it never occurred to me like right. the, the actual details or logistics of it. And we don't have a wedding ceremony anywhere in Luke or Matthew. Like we don't know what this ended up and it, like in my head. Uh, this all might be stemming from the fact that I'm watching Jane the Virgin with my wife and girls. So as <laughs> this is part of, but it, like in my head, I'm like, why don't they just get married right away? Like why, like what, wouldn't this solve a lot of the, the cultural like weirdness of the scenario, but I don't know, like there, there, there might be just as many good reasons to wait. I don't know. But like in my head, I always thought Mary's pregnant. Uh Oh, this is a problem. And Joseph struggles with it. And then it's like, all right, well, this is what God's doing. Then we're still going to get married. Great. They get married. And now when they travel, people are like, well, here's a young couple that's married and is about to have a baby. It never occurred to me that they were still not married yet at this point of the story or like still technically, I don't know. It's just a, it's, it's a strange detail. I had never noticed it in my whole life. So I've only heard the story 400,000 times, but there you go. Yeah. Well, it's just a weird. It's a weird thing. Like you're right. The, the traveling piece is weird now to me. And this whole thing gets stranger. But yeah, there's a lot. Well, yeah, we're so used to it that that there's there's a bunch here that's um. Well, what else? Well, uh, you you just you mentioned something that stuck out to you for the first time here, Greg. If you, um, but like what, what's what's had your attention here for a long time? Like what what about this passage? Yeah. Um, has has had the gears working for you for a long time. I think that the two the two details that have always been sort of interesting to me have been the I love the the phrasing of the in those days like there's something about like this is almost comic booky right like it's like mm-hmm. it's just like it's a it's a sort of stock phrase that immediately puts you in a place of like okay I know what Luke's doing now like he's a narrator who's he's telling us and like in those days the decree went out from emperor augustus and you almost hear behind it or parenthetically uh at least this is how i hear it in my like you know anarchist whatever it's like oh the government thinks they're doing one thing but god is doing this other thing right like that in those days when the emperor thought he was making this really important thing the government was getting Jesus to Bethlehem. Like that's kind of like, this is what's actually happening, right? Like what's really happening is, and I know there's a bunch of other stuff in the story and all that, but that, so that's the big one for me that I've heard a billion times. And in my head, I don't know that I can hear in those days a decree went out from Emperor Augustus without thinking, ah, God is, God is sneaking Jesus to Bethlehem. It's true. The guise of this like covert government, whatever. And, and the truth of the matter is that when we, when we do that kind of piecemeal historians work of trying to figure out when was this census and yeah. what were the exact circumstances, there's a little bit that's fuzzy here. Um, mm-hmm. Luke doesn't square with what um, one of our only real sources for the period, Josephus, says. And, and uh, it's not totally clear if, whether Josephus is remembering the, the rightly. Um, this is exactly the kind of thing that happened often, but I think the point is, this was a this is a massive logistical undertaking for the empire, yeah. really important sort of political move, 
to know exactly who you got so that you can um, you can leverage taxes to fund like yeah. the, the, the wealth of not not the state so much or but the emperor the emperor and his retinue in yeah. the military like that's what you do a census like this for right it's not they're not just looking for demographic information so that they can improve health care <laughs> that's <laughs> that's not the roman empire's um no <laughs> that's not their motive in this so so that's what their motive is what's interesting is that we can't exactly locate they're they're right. we, we can't actually figure out precisely what luke is referring to other than this kind of thing happened often but but the story um the story that this no name Jewish baby was born in Beth in Bethlehem, even though that wasn't where he was living at the time. Yeah. Through this, through this apparently random circum like series of events that, that has shaped all of history since. Yeah. Right. Which is I, astonishing I, really. And like they're in Bethlehem because Joseph who right. now we realize isn't even married to Mary yet. Right. And it's easy to feel like Joseph is a bit player, right? right? Because we, we never get, um, so I don't think, I don't think the new Testament ever reports to us anything Joseph says, right? Yeah. Joseph, Joseph is a character in the play that doesn't have any lines. Yeah. We see him do some things. Yeah. But, but we never see, we never hear Joseph say anything. Is that, um, he doesn't talk in Matthew at all. That's why I was just going to double check. Cool. No, we, we, we hear that he's been pondering. Right. Yeah, yeah. But he right actually, and so yeah, he was thinking love. thinking of divorcing Mary quietly when he yeah. found out. We hear what the angel says to him in a dream. And then we see the stuff that he does. And it's the yeah, same that's thing. Right. And this is our introduction. Um, really, like th this is this is the first place uh, in Luke's gospel that we see Joseph sort of on the move and and working right like he's or hear him at all hear of him at all really right like i don't know that yeah that's right when when gabriel showed up to mary back in chapter one yeah um we were just told about her that um she's never uh, been with a man yeah a man yeah <laughs> His name is joseph yeah so we were told that but here is where we actually meet this guy and we find out you're right so so there's a way in which this moment that must have felt really ambiguous in his life and, and an apparently senseless, like one more burden from right. on high, uh, handed down to, to people who couldn't afford the time away or the expense of, or the risk or danger of travel. Yep. All of that's actually, um, all of that's conforming history to, yeah. to something spoken long ago by the prophet Micah, which is that, um, that a shepherd for Israel, right? The, the long awaited capital K King was going to rise up somehow from Bethlehem, which was David's original home, right? Which is really amazing. Yeah, it's, it's pretty wild. And in, in Matthew one, Joseph is asleep the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, yeah. Because he has, the, he has the, the vision in a dream and then it says he wakes up or like, and then he, he wakes up from his sleep or whatever. But so he doesn't talk. Yeah, you're right. Like there's no... There's no dialogue. It's just the angel comes to him in a dream and tells him what's happening. So it's a, it's a pretty crazy, like when you start to add those pieces together, I don't know, like it's, it's uh, in my head always, I always, I don't know why you do this as you hear these stories over time, but like in my head, Joseph is like a carpenter who is just a, a little bit older guy who hasn't had any luck with women and now he gets betrothed to Mary for reasons we don't have any any real reasons to understand but it's like all right great I can settle down maybe I'll have a kid and hand over the carpentry shop or whatever right but the um and then you don't know much else about him beyond that really in these stories and then it's it's uh but I think there's there's something really interesting about I don't know if, we'll have to unpack it more I, I wonder if anybody else has commented on this because there's got to be people that I'm sure there are like like you know some of the scholastics have probably written whole treatises on on uh them not being married yet in this in this part of the story but yeah i'm sure you're right and i know um one one of the things that um that bits of the of the specifically roman catholic tradition of, of reflection on the bible 
they've they've thought a lot about Joseph. Like they 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 have a really yeah. soft, j- just like just like Mary's a big deal for them. Jo- Joseph's actually also a big deal, partly because of how there's a kind of ordinary quiet, like faithful sainthood there for them. Yeah, and, that's right. And I think there's something really beautiful about stopping and thinking about Joseph a little bit. Yeah. Well, the other detail that has been beat into yeah. my brain for years and years and years is uh, there was no place for them in the inn. Right. Um, and I have no idea. Like, it's just one of those, you know, you've seen it done in plays or in cartoons or read it a hundred thousand times or whatever. And it just always ends up being the, like, you know, we don't have any room, but here's this, you know, here's this barn. Um, I don't know. I, I don't really know what to do with that either other than the way it gets used in the story going forward. It doesn't seem like a detail that it's just one of those details that if you ask me, tell me about the birth of Jesus. I think almost anybody who's ever heard this story at all will say, well, he was born with all the animals in the barn. Like, yeah. And, and it's a weird one because it's, it's a very strange detail. Sometimes, I don't know. Sometimes people, um, sometimes people wonder about these stories, like people ask questions. And, and so you will meet, you'll meet people and you'll read things every year around Christmas where someone, someone writes a new article for time magazine about yeah. all the, all the stuff in, in these birth narratives that, that for sure didn't happen. And it's historically inaccurate. And the truth of the matter is that we actually don't really have good ways to check this stuff. Yeah. And no one really knows, no one can really prove or disprove anything. I do think that the the detail about him being them not not having a place in the inn, yeah. Let's say, presumably, like Bethlehem's not a huge place. It's not like there's a Motel Six. There aren't, there aren't like there aren't a lot of places to sleep, and it could be that they had to take the journey pretty slow if Mary was this pregnant. So whatever the reason, they sh- there's just there there's no vacancies, yeah. And in the place that they they sleep, yeah, it's like it's where you'd. Um, it's an unusual word. It's the only time it shows up in the New Testament, I think. And um, so the, this, this. Um, so here's a question, Nate. So, yeah, sorry. So okay, the, no, the, finish your thought. There, and then, and yeah. then jump in with your question is just that um, it's one of these things where it's, it's hard to know where the detail of Jesus lying in, in a manger, that is to say a feeding trough, like that's where they have to put the, the kid when he's born. It's hard to know where that detail comes from. If yeah. you, you know what I mean, it's a it's a it's a really specific, interest and odd detail. Yeah, right. There's no prophecy about that. I think is what I'm saying. So there's yeah. nothing in the Old Testament that would lead you that to lean that, that direction, right? Yeah. The closest yeah. you can get to it is that it becomes a sign for the shepherds in the next section, right? That's that right. You'll yeah. find this baby wrapped. That's how, that's how they'll know which kid it is or yeah. where. Right. The one lying in a manger. <laughs> Because that's not home. where the folks of Bethlehem usually had their kids for the night. That's right. That's exactly it. Okay. So when it says there was no place for them in the inn. Yeah. Uh, I have always heard this and mm-hmm. this might be a King James thing, or it might be something else that this is because the inn is full. Do we right. have any, any real reason that that's true linguistically, or is that just like a jump we make? It's ambiguous. The, the, the Greek, so no, there, there was no place for them in the inn uh, is about as straightforward a translation of the Greek as you can get. Okay. Um, so there's no, no ambiguity there. Is, but the ambiguity is why is there no place for them? Why? Yeah. Is this so here's, because? Here's what I'm asking. This is what I'm wondering now about this engagement thing, right? Are they not allowed to be in the inn because of a, uh because of their situation, right? Like, cause they're not married. She's about to have a kid. And the guy's just like, listen, there's no place for you here. I don't know. Like it, it we I've always, I, I've never ever thought about that before. So it's entirely possible. We're way out on a wrong. Yeah, branch here, but. The, the truth is just that I, I don't know that what, what we can say is that. Nate, I, your job on this, this I video know. is to know things, man. You got it. I know I'm failing at my job. Sometimes, sometimes Bible scholars have this bad habit of pretending to know more than the text actually says. And we could, so you could, you could ask, 
like yeah maybe so maybe maybe they're Maybe there's some small mindedness here or like some stiff cultural moors that are sort of locked. That's what's curious. Yeah, that's yeah. Yeah, and, and that's and that's certainly possible. What we should say though, I think, is that Luke Luke, it'd be very easy for Luke as a storyteller to draw our attention to that. And he doesn't. And he doesn't. So so it's that's left evidenced by the four hundred thousand times I've heard it and just now realized it. So it's not a it's not a detail he brings right to the fore for no, sure. No, but but I mean, this is part of this is also part of the way that the Bible engages us is that that like it doesn't tell us everything we'd want to know. Just like uh, there's a lot about the way the birth happens that's just sort of like skimmed by. Yeah, it just goes super and, fast. And if you were wanting to turn this into a Hollywood screenplay, you would want to fill that stuff out. Like there's so much we would want yeah. to know as an audience. Um, so it's often we just it's, cut I, away to the manger. <laughs> And then cut quick to the shepherds. It's like, wait, what? What's happening here, guys? No, I, I think that's fair. Uh, I, it just it, it would it never occurred to me before. But that phrasing is so strange that there was strange just in the sense of the giving no reason for it at all. I was curious about. Yeah, yeah, fair. And he kind of adds it like, this makes sense of the manger, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> right, right, like, yeah. This this wasn't Mary and Joseph's idea of like a. This, this wasn't them being like proto hipsters. Yeah, exactly. Rec reclaimed barnwood crib for the kid. That, exactly. <laughs> Let's lay the kid in the manger. No reason given at all. That's right. It's, it's going to make it. I'll clear this part up for you. Grand. Yeah. It's just not a place in the end, guys. Yeah. It's going to get lots of likes on the Instagram. Yeah. Um, so we, we want to jump on and talk, talk about the shepherds or? Yeah, yeah I think we probably should. All right. Might as well. We've got probably 10 or 15 minutes left. So if we want to start in on the shepherds, I think it's a good call. Okay. Oh, real quick before we do that. Sorry. Yeah, of course. Um, so uh, you mentioned it sort of in passing, but let's, let's hammer down on this just a little bit further. This Emperor Augustus, we just don't really know who he is or when this is exactly or when this particular census is or we're just kind of foggy on the history here or what? Well, it's it's a tiny it's a tiny bit complicated do you want me to um and it's a little above my my pay grade in terms of my own historical knowledge but there's so, i read someone really good on it last week um do you want me to pull him up sure uh, i thought he was what, really what, I'm, what, what i kind of the reason i think it's important yeah is because uh pastorally there are times in our lives where we run across these like yeah. these these moments in scripture where historically the way we do history we have a hard time verifying it or maybe once we're sure that there's like some ambiguity here it becomes really difficult for us to trust it in the way but yeah. i think i think that stuff is is sort of maybe overblown in this story to some degree but i'm i'm, I'm mostly i'm curious about how do you how do you how do we take these stories seriously how do we how do we trust them lean into them in certain ways when we're not positive about the history all the way right so two things one is that augustus was a real emperor and quirinius was a real governor these aren't made up people gotcha um that's the first thing the, the second thing is that we're very short on historical sources that talk about that give up they give us clear ways to date this stuff one of our only sources is a, is a jewish writer named josephus and Josephus, sometimes we can tell from lining him up with other things we know, nails it, doesn't always nail it. If you were writing about things that had happened 80 years ago, yeah, right before you were born, yep. you were you'd be relying and, and you had no internet and no no like no no newspapers, no official records of any kind, you're gonna be relying on sort of like a kind of a kind of hearsay and sifting sources, and you're gonna get some stuff spot on, and there's probably other stuff you're gonna get wrong so that's that's, that's me not knocking josephus josephus right. is one of our best sources it's for the way things. history works yeah yeah it's just the way history works and it's the way it always works um even in our own lives yeah. i asked my mom um i remember all kinds of story like details about what um about my my birth which almost didn't happen it's in the story for another time um and uh they almost lost me um and it was sort of an emergency situation. And uh, and so I asked my mom about it last week uh, for whatever reasons. And, <laughs> and 
she actually made me realize that I, I misremembered things she, I thought she told me as a kid, but she filled out the picture and there was like whole dimensions of that story that I had forgotten about entirely, yeah. right? And so that's just the way that even our own histories work, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, when, when it comes to this, so Augustus uh, is super real emperor, that fits the period. Quirinius um, is around this time too. We know from other sources for sure that about every 14 years, about every 14 years, they tended to do one of these, um, these censuses. The, the 14 sort of year doesn't, doesn't line up exactly with this, but it's hard to know because it doesn't mean that they didn't call a special right. one for some reason. Right. And that we just don't have record of any other way. So this is what uh, one of my favorite writers on the Gospel of Luke, uh, a French scholar named Francois Bovon, Francois Bovon, or Bo Bovon, it'll look like, he, there we go. Now we're talking. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> he said, secular sources report that at various times, Augustus ordered individual provinces to be counted or his private property, including imperial provinces, to be estimated. A certain regularity every 14 years seems to have prevailed for these censuses, at least in Egypt. We're not in Egypt. He's saying <laughs> we, have, we have we have the most we have the most information about what's what was happening in Egypt within the empire. Um, but it never, as far as we know, it never became a single general decree. So, but, but that is what Luke, that's the picture Luke paints here. Yeah. So it's, it depends. Um, Luke does correctly capture the historical tendency of the time and of the emperor. And that's what we can know for sure. Um, so that's, yeah, that's good. And 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 uh, and Bovon says uh, uh, that, that Josephus seems to struggle with this period, so it's not exactly clear if we should trust what Josephus says about Quirinius. So, so it's that that kind of thing where when we when we meet these, um, so that that's whenever I read one of those things that comes out every Christmas, um, I'm always interested because history history interests me. The detective work of history is interesting, yeah. in it, and I think it should interest Christians. Um, and, uh, and so I, I weigh that and I remember too, that we actually don't know. And that sometimes, uh, all kinds of things get forgotten or only told by one lonely source. And, um, what we can say, I think for sure is that Luke paints a very historically plausible picture that would, that would make sense. Um, that this fits other things that we know, the details are a little fuzzy. But the point of the scripture seems to be that like in the middle of real, the real rough and tumble of political life, yeah. so like regular life as it was under the Roman empire, God, God birthed a king that was going to overthrow the Roman empire eventually through his followers yeah. kind of way and take over it in a strange way too. And so that, um, so the, the history, I think what I'm trying to say is the history might be fuzzy, but the fact that this is happening on the pages of real history really matters. Yes, 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 yes. And that's the, we talked about this in the first chapter too, but actually this is a good point because uh, Luke starts the second chapter very similar to how he starts the first chapter, right? That in the in in this time period, in this place with this ruler, whatever, now it's not just like, uh, so Luke one starts with that in the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah, right? Like, and it's like, okay, so you're giving us, uh, some sort of historical context, some regional context, whatever. Right. And this happens, this happens all over the old Testament, by the way, this is how almost every old Testament story starts too. Um, but then Luke two does the same thing, but now this government is not just in the background of the story. Now the government is trying to uh, move the story. Now the government is doing something, right? Um, in the Zechariah story, it's there, it sets the context, and then Zechariah lives into it. And this is, uh, if I'm just going to keep pushing the same horse all the time, uh, this is the step parallelism piece happening, even in the way the birth of Jesus is being told here, right? So, so uh, now it's not just that there's a government context, but now that government context is actually acting in the story, right? So it's just, it's the same thing, but just a touch more a little bit further but and i think this is the beauty of this this story right like it is a misreading of the jesus story to believe that jesus is not interacting politically that's right and that's uh it's 
it's a common misreading of the Jesus story, but it is absolutely a misreading, especially in the West. Um, this is just something that the back, like Luke gives us as much sort of obvious, I'm talking about politics here. When I talk about kingdom, I'm talking about real kingdoms in real places. Right. Um, and so I think that's, it's a, it's a really, I'm glad you called our attention back to that because that really is an important, important piece. It's not, and, and we've talked about it before and we'll talk about it again as we go on. The, it's not that Jesus, this is what's so hard about history for, for church folks, I think, right? Is that it isn't that Jesus doesn't matter to us now or isn't alive and active in the world now because he absolutely is, right? But the, the very specificness or the specificity of Jesus in Jesus's time, in Jesus's family, in Jesus's culture, in Jesus's country, in this place, that really, really matters uh, both to who Jesus is, to who God is, to who we are, like that. So, so we can't just, I know for sure for me, like I've gone whole stretches of my life where it's like, I just don't like history. Like there's just too much there for me to even start to get into. It's not my thing. And it really isn't my thing. But even that, we cannot rip Jesus out of that history and try to make sense out of Jesus. It just doesn't, it's the gospels do not let us do that. And Luke in particular. Yeah, G Jesus, there's a there's a way in which because of the choices that that God made, the choices that God made freely and of his own creative love in the scriptures, Jesus could not have been born a Danish and Scottish descended Canadian. Yeah. Right? right. That doesn't actually make sense. Um, it can't that can't be the way the story goes. Jesus has to be Jewish. And the same is true. Jesus can't be American. Um, whoa, 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 whoa. Easy. I know, I know. I'm, I'm <laughs> that, right? Sounds like you're separating America and Israel, Nate, and we need to be careful with that. <laughs> what I mean is that, that like, uh, Paul says, in the fullness of time, God sent his son to be born under the law by, like, yeah. through a woman. And, um, and I think we Christians have to take that really seriously. Like, this is the way it happened. And, and, the way that God does things is inseparable from who God is and what God does. Right. Like that's right. Um, so that, that, uh, let's that, say that, say that one more time, Nate, if you can, so, if you can say that one more time. Yeah. Um, the way God does things yes. is absolutely inseparable from what God does. Yes. And why God does it. And ultimately who God is. Right. Yes. So that, um, one of my favorite theologians says, God is whoever raised Jesus from the dead. Yep. Having first raised Israel out of Egypt. And we'll come back to that, I think, in, in, in the course of time. But but that notice what that means. That means that that God's choice in this world has been that you can't talk about God truly without talking about Jesus and without talking about Israel. Yep. Yeah. But we try to do that. We've tried to do that a lot. We do try to do that. And so this is, it's a very important corrective that we're going to keep coming back to because in Luke, it's Luke, Luke will not let us get very far away from that. But the point about the way that God does things matters as much as what it is that God does. Um, that's going to be super true of Jesus as we go forward as well. And it's, yeah. it's, it's going to be really important for us to sort of, um, one of my favorite books ever is a book called Politics of Jesus. Uh, and, and Yoder starts that book by listing like the nine ways we get Jesus wrong, basically like, uh, or, or nine ways that we make Jesus not normative for Christian ethics is what he's really arguing. And his right, point right. is we come up with nine, we have nine basic built-in reasons not to, to pay attention to the why of Jesus, right. Or like the, the how of Jesus, like how Jesus does something. And, uh, and so, uh, it's a really helpful corrective that as we go through Luke, we're going to pay attention to because how Jesus does things really, really is significant. And in scripture, we know this, like we, we, we know if we read old Testament prophets or we read Jeremiah and he strips down naked and runs through the city, like that means something, right? Like it's the how of that really matters. Right. And so, uh, we're going to see some things like that, these sort of prophetic symbolic acts of Jesus, but even just the like day to day being with his disciples, there's something important about this too, right? Like the, the how is going to matter for us as much as the what. 
Um, so we'll be on the lookout for that and we'll be paying attention to that. And I think, Nate, we've definitely gone long enough that we don't have to go into the Shepherds today. So it's great. And the, but this is a great spot to point ahead to the Shepherds because, yeah. because probably one of the things we should take away from if we assume that the way that God goes about things isn't just an accident, it's not just sort of like him riffing on the fly, then yes. that means that that paying attention to how the birth of Jesus goes up, goes down. Hmm. Why a manger? Why are the shepherds the per, why are the shepherds the ones who get the 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 angel yeah. um, the angel announcement? Why them? Wh- who, rather than other folks and i so that's going to be a question for next week yeah that's a good one all right man well thanks for jumping in with us guys uh we're gonna sit here and look uh amazing for the next 20 seconds or so because that's the end of a youtube video and uh if uh, yeah <laughs> so if you if uh if you did enjoy this go ahead and subscribe or like or do all the stuff you're supposed to do on youtube so that you can find out when we do new ones they drop every friday morning uh we're not doing them the same day they come out a little bit later after we record them i think uh, at least that's been the this current setup so all right well we'll see you next friday uh if you want to read ahead you can absolutely do that we're still going to be in loop two talking about shepherds next week so uh nate as per usual thanks for doing this one of the highlights of my week i really appreciate it